Hi and welcome to our next session on uh, our ongoing series or meetings in linguistic anthropology, Omelia. And um, we have so far been looking at the uh, initial, the initial um, the subject of linguistic anthropology and that is semiotics, semiology, semiosis. Uh, within the, um, the very broad or quite broad um, field of semiotics and semiology, uh, we've looked at, uh, of course, the fundamentals and who better to start with than Saussure, Saussure because you know, Saussure's um, pioneering work is you know, historically and um, uh, academically very uh, pivotal. Pivotal. So we looked at Saussure, we looked at Peirce, and Peirce's work differed to Saussure's. It differed to Saussure's, but not so much. You know, the principle was there, but just a, a reformation of that principle in his own ways. And you know, um, uh, we know that Peirce was quite um, religious in many ways. I mean, his work was quite religious. The idea of the Trinity, and uh, you know, which also emerged in Russian formalism and so forth. And, okay, and that was a structuralist perspective. Then we began to look at, uh, began to look at, uh, because we certainly did not extend, on Roland Barthes. And Roland Barthes was, um, you know, uh, his work on semiology and the text was very important. The ways in which he applied semiology to text were very important and very, very interesting. And we only began to look at Roland Barthes, you know, uh, to actually um, extend on his work would take weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and you know um, we will see what we can do in time. Today we are going to take uh, semiology uh, to uh, another level or to an, in another direction and look at the very fundamentals, the very fundamentals of this man called Jacques Lacan. Now Lacan uh, was, uh, or should we say Lacan, Lacan um, you know, he was a um, uh, French and he was a psychologist, I guess we could say psychology was his um, forte and um, uh, you know, there was a, um, a lot of commotion around Jacques Lacan and we were going to speak a little about that while also speaking about the fundamentals of his work. Now to discuss his work in detail is in one or two hours is really impossible because, you know, um, although he did not do that much um, work in, in a diverse sense, he, you know, to, to understand, to get, to get his um, fundamental ideas and how they really, really work, the mechanics, it just takes a lot of discussion. And, you know, we cannot even begin to pray to be able to do that in an hour or so, you know. But we, we, today's a beginning, it's a start, so we're going to begin to do that today. So we are going to now begin to look at the very fundamentals of Jacques Lacan and see what we can um, progress with and see if we can cover um, a substantial part of the uh, plan that we have to, to cover today. Now, you know, you all have your, um, your devices and if for any of those who do not have a device or there's a problem with your device, um, you know, either find someone and share with them on their device or share the, de the, the device of somebody else with them or, um, uh, you know, there are, there are some, there are, I think there are a few, very few uh, copies of this on hard print paper going around. So please, um, you know, um, adjust in that way and, you know, follow through. You, you'll get all the diagrams and everything there. Okay, so the semi-logical underpinnings of uh, Jacques Lacan. You know, again, we, we have this idea of the, the signifier, which is initially an artifact. And it's an artifact until it becomes a sign or part of the sign. And when that sign becomes, then we have all the elements of the sign. Language does not come a bit at a time. Language comes all at once. Yeah, you don't just get part of language and another part of language. Language comes all at once. Okay, remember when we looked at the structuralism of Saussure, we saw that there is no such thing as um, only one element of language. In order to get one part of language, you need to know the rest so you can make the comparison. Okay, so language 
comes all at once. Very important. So, okay, so the artifact becomes the signifier and the signified. So we have the, um, the object and its appearance. If you look at the diagram, you'll see that at the top we have an object and then that points to its appearance. Okay, so there's some kind of object, but it appears in some way. So let us just now say that there's um, something that's placed in the mind and it becomes, it appears in some way. There's an apparition, there emerges an apparition in some way. This was basically the, um, the general idea or maybe the fundamental idea of Jacques Lacan, that there is something in the mind and it appears in some way linguistically. Now Jacques Lacan was a big um, fan, should I say, uh, an avid uh, follower of Freud and he took what Freud um, did but he added the, the element of language to it. He said, look, you know, um, this is all uh, great but in fact um, what we're seeing is a linguistic manifestation of Freudian thought. If you look at the next diagram, you'll see that there's the, again, the signifier, the signified system, and the other fact prior to becoming the signifier is an artifact. But uh, following it becoming a signifier is no longer an artifact, but it's a sign. It's a sign system. It's a sign system. It doesn't happen one bit at once, it happens all at once. Language happens all at once. Okay, so um, let's look at the fact that. Um, an imagination uh, may become a reality. So the signifier may be imagination and it may become reality in some way. Or the opposite. Reality may become imagination. <coughs> where you, um, so the, the first instance where imagination becomes reality, you imagine something then f in some way you enact this, enact this and it becomes a reality. Okay. Or uh, you see something that's enacted and in some way and then you imagine things about it. There's an imagination. You see yourself in the mirror and then you start to think of um, how wonderful you are and how more handsome or beautiful or hot you are than other people and that you're super or something. Okay, so the object becomes an apparition in certain ways. I also realize that these terms can be um, obfuscatory, so we will uh, hence uh, remember what we said a few sessions ago that um, despite there being many terms, it's the principle that we need to understand. And we can relabel these as we like, as long as we know that other people may have different terms and you know may, may mean something else, etc. Okay, so if we go to our next diagram, we see that um, to our lower left we have imagination at the lower right we have symbolism and at the top at B we have reality. So what is this saying and why have we positioned this as such? Well, um, to put it simply of course, imagination, let's say that um, imagination is the instigator of our thought and so something we have in imagination is a signifier. Then the symbolic, symbolic aspect which is socially conventional, uh, is how it appears to or should appear, should appear, and that using that word should is quite dangerous, but you know, we use it in, in a, you know, quite spare, sparingly in this situation. So the, the law right is the symbol, okay, the symbolic nature of it. At the top, with B, at the top is the uh, the reality of the sign which we situate in a certain way and in that way um, it becomes quite situated for the observer or the person who is interpreting the sign. Okay, The mental sign. So we are going to begin looking at uh, Lacan's work by looking at two frameworks, two of his frameworks. And these frameworks uh, are you know quite central to the work, the evolving um, ideas that we will discuss in the next hour or so. Uh, and it's quite interesting also that um, although these, um, this work all fits together and you put all this together, the 
um, I, parts, separate, separate parts of uh, his work were all evolved uh, and were all um, uh, developed in separate parts of his life and then putting them all together and everything. The first framework we're going to look at is the Need, Demand, Desire uh, trilogy, um, triad. The conceptual terminological triad in Lacanian theory, uh, Need, Demand and Desire, uh, was something that he ultimately decided or argued that um, fits into separate parts of form formatory or formative years of the child. And he spoke that in each of these three, the intervention of signifiers, the intervention of signifiers of the symbolic order was very integral. And he, he builds on that when he discusses the big other and the small other and everything. Okay, the um, signification uh, framework in uh, need, demand, and desire is very important, and especially when you get to, um, well, you know, the uh, second part, the mirror stage, which we will discuss, and then the, um, the third stage, which is the big other and the name of the father and everything, and, you know, the way in which we integrate into society and so forth. Signification is crucial, crucial, or, or um, acknowledging signification is crucial. Okay, he, Lacan has told us that um, signification is important and the intrusion of signifiers um, is both um, pertinent to body and mind and of course society and the ways in which we place ourselves in society. Okay, so how does um, then need, um, demand and desire then uh, uh, actually, how do they fit together? Well, first of all, um, we are a being of need. We have needs. And we can, um, Lacan tells us that we can um, achieve or we can obtain what we need. We can obtain what we need. But through discipline, through discipline, um, we become uh, a subject of desire. And that discipline is very, um, is linguistic, of course. It's linguistic. It's psycholinguistic, psycholinguistic. Well, you know, you know, in Lacanian terms, it is psycholinguistic. Okay, so that ultimately brings us to um, a process of socialization, a kind of discipline, a kind of discipline uh, instigating in us a process of continual desire, continual desire. Well, you know, you know, these are just words now. We will describe them for more, more, as time goes on, we will evolve. And that becomes a socialization process, okay, through semiotics. So in the process then, we identify with the maternal, paternal um, aspects of others. And these maternal and paternal aspects are distributed across the real and the symbolic. The other framework I want to quickly discuss prior to um, going on is the aspect of otherness. Now, what does the other mean, the other? In Lacanian terms, in Lacanian thought, the other is uh, in, separated into two parts. Um, there is um, uh, the, the social other and the individual other, really, or uh, the imaginary ego and accompanying alter egos in one aspect, and the social egos in another aspect. So what we do in the process, what we do is we relate to other people, we relate to other people as our alter egos, as we imagine about them, as we imagine about them, and then we project them onto ourselves. Okay, so we see somebody in a certain way, and we, um, you know, imagine things about them, then we project them onto ourselves and think, okay, what if they were me? What if I were them? Then how would I be acting? Am I up to, up to grade? Am I, uh, you calibrate yourselves, uh, ourselves, we calibrate ourselves against them, and then we start to um, revise, reappropriate, or recalibrate who we are, reassess, reassessment, as my uncle used to say, reassessment. So what is otherness then? Otherness, if we look at the other, we um, see that we, there are two othernesses, two othernesses which correspond to each of the symbolic and the real. 
The first one, the big other, the big other, represents represents a dynamic which situates itself within within the symbolic order, the symbolic order of things, the social order, the social order, the symbolic social order of things, ways in which we have had our lives structured, uh, and. This is an overarching objective spirit of a trans individual, trans individual meaning you know, from individual to individual, social linguistic structure. Okay. So basically, it's the overarching idea uh, in society where language becomes the, the um, connecting, framework, connecting framework. It's the configuring field of intersubjective interactions. So, it's the, the field that configures the ways in which we construct our society with the communities or in the communities that we, uh, that we live. The other big other, which is, uh, according to Lacan, um, the, the, uh, the big other connected to the real order, refers to the anonymous authoritative power and or knowledge. Okay, so it's the authoritative autonomous power. So, for example, whether uh, that of God or nature or, or history, society, state, party, science, etc., um, it, whether it's that power connected to any of these or not, um, makes no difference because it's still another big other. It's like a meta narrative, a meta narrative, so to speak. Okay. In this instance, the analyst, the subject, the subject, is the person who is knowledgeable about the whole system. So it becomes a big other for the person, the individual, the subject. So Lacan tells us that the child in its formatory years, in its formatory years, um, has really three stages. There are three stages, and these three stages are quite clearly divided, not temporally, of course, but because you, you know, you could be um, an early developer or a late developer and so forth, but the, the, the ways in which these um, stages um, materialize or manifest in, in, um, in the way that the child acts are quite clear and distinct. And this is very interesting because, um, you know, uh, it was, uh, uh, um, Lacan was Freudian in, in many, many ways. He was, a, as I said before, he was a, um, avid Freudian, and he did um, uh, persist that uh, his work was quite Freudian, but he um, uh, contributed to Freudian thought in, in uh, his direction towards uh, language and the linguistic system uh, of who we are. The initial stage of the baby's life, Lacan tells us, is, is the infancy stage. Now, the infancy stage was um, a domination of a chaotic mix of perceptions, feelings, and needs. You know, there's no um, hole in the baby. There's no coherency at all. The baby is everything and anything working at any time. It's a chaos, a chaos within a uh, material body. The baby doesn't know anything. The baby cannot do anything. Speaking very philosophically, philosophically, not um, somatologically, of course. Um, the baby cannot do anything, cannot do. So the baby simply, simply um, is, simply is, simply emerges, simply emerges. Okay, so the baby is a chaotic mix of perceptions, needs, feelings, attitudes. The baby is connected to the mother. The baby knows nothing, nothing but the mother, okay, the food source, nothing else. Because, you know, that's where all the fun is, right? Filling your stomach and sleeping. In this sense, the baby is indistinguishable, according to itself, is indistinguishable to the world. The baby doesn't know, doesn't feel, doesn't know, doesn't see any separation between itself and the food source, the mother. You know, that's where everything is, and that is the whole world for the baby. There is nothing else for the baby. 
The baby lives only to connect with the mother and the mother's breast, and there is nothing else. Okay? And there's no need for anything else because you know, the baby has no other semiotic potential. The baby cannot walk, the baby cannot um, roll, cannot sit up, can do nothing. So that's where the baby is. The baby is very much connected to its world as one and sees no separation, and that is um, the infancy stage. And it's really the closest, the closest it becomes, or it can become and does become to a pure materiality of existence. And this is what Lacan calls the real, the real. And if you look at the small uh, diagram there, you'll see that the baby sees itself and the world in the same way. It's the same signifier, it's the same thing. There is no what I call articulation of sign. Uh, the sign articulation is zero. It does not articulate um, among signs. Everything is the same. Its mother and itself are the same thing. Now, in, in the process, um, the baby doesn't just come to a point where it decides to change, and the body and the, the, the uh, mentality of the baby don't just change. You know, there are gradual processes emerging, emerging. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens gradually. It begins at a low level, and you know, it's either linear or asymptotic or something. Uh, or logarithmic or something, but it's always a gradual process. So the baby um, previously or initially saw itself, signified itself and the world in the same way. So it saw itself as one with the mother and everything else, and you know nothing else really uh, was anything but the mother's um, breast and its food source. But then the baby begins to begins to fragment begins to fragment everything around it, itself, the world, and everything. It begins to see some fragments. And it begins to territorialize, territorialize itself and the world. And it begins to, to articulate things into sort of sectors and compartments and territories, and uh, including the, um, the input and output to the body, which are the erogenous zones, you know, including the underarms. If you tickle a baby under the underarms, it giggles or something, you know, it likes it. Uh, but there, there's the mouth, there's the groin, the sexual organs, which the mother focuses on in some way or another, you know, feeds the baby or it cleans the baby after it releases um, its, its waste, and these become uh, erogenous zones, you know, its nipples or its um, underarms and so forth. So the, the baby begins to territorialize and separate these um, into their distinct, uh, distinctive values and purposes. Fragmentation actually parallels an identification with objects that fulfill a certain lack. So we have a certain lack in what we need and uh, this fragmentation actually symbolizes the identification with this um, lack. Like, for example, um, the mother's breast that feeds us for so long as we are growing, then when this begins to disappear, then we have a um, certain fragmentation. We know that, okay, that's gone. Now I need to compensate for that in another way. How do I do that? Well, there are other ways to do it. And whether um, I need the mother's breast for nutritional purposes, or I um, picture that later on in life um, in sexual ways, and there um, emerges the um, Oedipus complex, then that remains to be discussed and um, explored. But we do fragment in certain ways, and that fragmentation becomes predicated on um, how we, um, how we uh, perceive a lack a lack. Okay. So it's actually the lack that symbolizes um, the, uh, who we are and, and what we need and our worlds, and that becomes very structuralist, doesn't it? Okay. Remember, if you remember the, the idea of semiotic uh, difference in Saussure's work where we look at associating things with what is not. 
you know, in the syntactic or in the syntactic um, axis or the paradigmatic axis. We do it in such a way so that we um, look at uh, the negative association or we negatively associate the elements in a language. This construction of boundaries constitutes the first step towards socialization. To socialize ourselves, we need to know our place in society. We look at how in our formative years, how we have been initially raised and how we have had boundaries uh, drawn between us and that initial enculturation. And then we know our place, we know our place. So the construction of these boundaries of um, lack um, is a process which contributes towards socialization. And according to Lacan, this is the first step away from the real. Right? External objects here, the external objects do not perfectly assimilate. Now you remember that we, uh, we spoke about um, a difference, of course, because we're going to again explore that in a Lacanian way, we hope today. The external objects do not perfectly assimilate. They don't, it's not like everything is a perfect assimilation or a perfect, very rigid, very rigid. In fact, it's anything but rigid. Anything but rigid, because the sign is always changing. There's the um, uh, eternal um, semiosis and infinite semiosis. The external objects do not perfectly assimilate. So they, they do not fulfill the void. They cannot fulfill the void. So there's always a lack. There is an establishment of a psychic dynamic, which is a fantasy versus a lack. You know, there's a lack, and you're always fantasizing about um, desiring, desiring, fantasizing about what could be to fulfill the lack or to fill the lack. And uh, it is the, that constitutes an ongoing process throughout life. If you look at this diagram then, and we have again our signifier and our um, signified. Here we have our different body parts. Body part one, body part two, and we see that we begin to fragment them. So, you know, they're not the same signified anymore. There's some sort of mediation, and the mediation brings the signification process to pursue different pathways. So body part one pursues a slightly different pathway to body part two, because we are now able to mediate in different ways. And the sign articulation, which was previously zero, is now larger than zero.